invite you to open your Bible to the book of Genesis, chapter 28. Genesis 28. You know, in the Sabbath school um, classes, um, this quarter, we're going to be studying this book. It's a historical book. It's a book about our origins. And we're going to read a story that's found in chapter 28. Let's start with verse 10. Genesis 28, verse 10. Now it says, Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head and he laid down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and it stopped, it stopped, reached the, to the heavens. And there the angels of God ascending, and they were also descending. Verse 13. And behold, the Lord God stood above it, the, the ladder, and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land of which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Verse 15, Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until you have done what I have spoken to you. Verse 16, Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And this is the place where Jacob met God. Have you ever felt anxious, distressed? Anyone? Hands? Most, most of us. Something in your life that was distressing you, maybe it's distressing you, something you didn't know how to handle. In the past two weeks, I had to conduct two funerals. And funerals are at times, um, it's not the, the best uh, occasion. It's nothing like a camp. And this coming week, there will be another funeral uh, for the mother of Pastor Flamenco, who uh, died tragically in a car accident. Um, not long ago. And in moments like this, the question always arises, where is God? I've had people asking me this question. Where is God? How do you hear God's voice in a time of affliction, in a time of anxiety, in a time of difficulty? How can we hear this voice, His voice? God, He can use a lot of things to communicate with us. Can you help me? I want to ask, hear from you. What are the ways that God used to communicate with us? Music. Music, yes, music. That is true. There's a, a real connection of our heart with God. Any other example? Dreams. 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 Prayer. 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 Nature. People. Nature. Anything else? Bible. The Bible. The Bible, yes. And uh, perhaps the greatest revelation of God's communication with us, Jesus himself coming down. God can communicate with us through all those things, even in good times and in bad times. God can use anything. And he wants to communicate with you because he, he loves you. And He loves us. And in the Bible, because He loves us, the main thing that He communicates is that He wants 
to be with you. You are his child. And did you know that in his love letter to you, the main thing that God communicates is, I want to be with you. Yeah. And you know why you don't need to be afraid? One of the greatest promises that we find in the Bible, it appears many times, is this. Fear not. Do not be afraid. Do you know how many times these words have, are found in the Bible? Guess. I'm just going to skip this. Let's see. Let's see if anyone guess. 365 times. One word we got the end. Yeah. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And why are we not to be afraid? Why should we not be afraid? Because God is by our side. He's with us. And that's basically it. I could finish the sermon right now. <laughs> but there's a bit more in the story that I'd like to uh, extract for you. In Joshua 1.9, we have this text um, that says, Be strong and courageous. You know this text. Be strong and courageous. And what else? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. He, he said these words to Joshua when he was a bit, uh, he was fearful having to face the enemy and having to face the task of leading the people of Israel into a new land. But what about you? What about me? What about us? How can, we be, how can you be convinced that God is by your side? What can convince you that God is with you? That the Lord is your shepherd? Like David said when he said in Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me through the valley of the shadows of death. I will fear no evil. I won't even fear death. How can you? How could he write this? Well, he says, For your rod, for your staff, comfort me. You know, God has always wanted to be with us. When he approached Moses, he said, Moses, I want you to build a sanctuary for me, a tabernacle, a tent. Why, God? Because I want to dwell among you, with you. And a long time later, God could no longer hold it back. He, he desires so much to be with us in the world that in John... John chapter 1, verse 14 says that the Word, who's the Word? Jesus. Jesus, God. Verse 14 says that He became flesh and He lived among us. It has always been the desire of God to be with us. In His last days on, on earth, in Matthew 28, Jesus said, Behold, I am with you. Always, even to the end of the age. And about the future, Jesus said in Revelation 21, thir uh, verse 3, that the throne of God will be here. God will dwell with us. We shall be his people, and he, and he will be our God. God's desire is clear. What's God's desire? He wants to be with you. He wants to be with me. What's God's desire? Let me hear it from you. What's God's desire? Be with us. Amen. And I want you to say, He wants to be with me. What's God's desire? Be with me. He wants to be with me. Amen. But then why? If He wants to be with us, and He said, I'm with you always, why do we often fail to identify the presence of God in our lives? Why are there moments that we don't see Him? We don't feel that He's by our side. Do you think there are some people who are more sensitive to that than others? Yes. I think one of the obvious causes for this is the separation that sin has caused between us and God. And we often look at the results of sin. What are some of the results of sin that you heard about this week? War? Death. Death of somebody? Someone's got 
Like we have a number of people who couldn't be here today because they're sick. Did you know that? And we're thinking of them because we wish they were here. They couldn't, couldn't come. That's one result of sin. But we have death, we have tragedies, we have diseases. And we look at those things and the sadness and we think, God can't be close to me because these things are happening to me. And often we don't feel, we don't perceive, and we doubt. Where is this God of love? Where is this God of love? The Lord repeated this message in the Bible. What is the message that he repeats the most in his love letter to you? What is it? He desires to be with me. With you. He won. The message is clear. But we often don't realize it. Do you know what? The problem is not with God. The problem is with me. The problem is with us. We are the ones who need to learn to see, to feel, and experience our Creator. For example, in the story that we read at the beginning, what was going on? Tell me, what's going on? Okay. We read Genesis 28. What's going on? Tell me. Who is the main character that we see in the story? Jacob. Jacob. And what's happening? Where is he? He's come to Haran. He's in the... Uh, which is the desert area? Yes. What is he doing there in a dangerous place called far from home? Why is he there? He's running away. He's running away. And why is he running away? He made something bad. He, he, made his he deceived his whole family. Oh. And he actually stole money from his brother. He lied, robbed his brother for money, and his brother was so angry to the point of wanting to do what to Jacob. He was ready to kill him. He saw what you don't mess with Jacob. He saw him. He was a hunter. He had a few weapons. And Jacob was so scared, and he took off. And I think, I imagine that he was probably like running this whole day, and now he was exhausted, and he was in the desert, and he's as scared as he could be, but he's so tired, like he didn't eat, hadn't eaten, he hadn't drunk anything. And now, he just decided to lie there on the desert floor, picked up a pillow as, his, as rock as his pillow, and then during the dream that he just basically is exhausted, he just falls asleep. He has a dream. So tell me, what did he see in, in this dream? A ladder. He looks and there's his ladder. And the sky opened and there's a ladder. Wouldn't that be cool to see this? Okay, what else was on that ladder? Angels going up and down. Do you think that means that angels come and go from heaven? Sounds like it is. What, what, why do they come here to the earth? What do they do down here? To protect us. To protect us. Yeah, the Bible tells us so. But then he, suddenly he turns and he sees someone else. Who does he see? God. The Lord. And the Lord says to him, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of your father Isaac, and I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go. And then Jacob, he, he responds in a surprising way. Let's have a look at verse six, uh, 16 and 17 again. Look what Jacob did. He awoke from his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid, and he said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the, uh, the gates of heaven. This is, is an extraordinary recognition from Jacob. God is here, in the middle of nowhere. He is here, with me. Me, and he's thinking, you know, Jacob, a human, a sinner, he finally had a real experience with God. He finally recognized that 
presence of God. He was sleeping and then he was awakened by the presence of God. And guess what? Many times we also sleep. And there's more than one way to wake up to the, to the same realization that God is by our side. Sometimes God uses the wonderful blessings to wake us up to the fact that he's with us. We perceive a blessing maybe through a physical healing, maybe a marriage, someone gets married, maybe, maybe your, your child is able to accomplish something they couldn't accomplish before. You realize that there's a God helping them. But sometimes we are awakened through suffering, through a delicate, unexpected situation. Sometimes, because of a tragedy, we awaken to the fact that God is by our side. In my life, when I went through the deepest tra tragedy that I went through my life, that's the time when it felt God the closest to me. The problem is that many of us continue to live as if God is not by our side. It is as if we were still sleeping, no realization. I watched this funny YouTube video of a uh, the little girl's been a baby sitting on, uh, and then the mom's filming and the dad walks from behind and the baby had never met the dad without the beard and the dad shaved the beard. I don't know if anyone has seen this video. And then he says hello to the baby and the baby starts to cry. The baby just, and the baby literally goes like this. Ah. And, and the baby did not recognize this her own dad, her own father. And apparently, according to what we just read in Genesis uh, 28, 16, it seems like it happened to Jacob. It ha and it happens to us. It's possible to be present in someone's, that God is present in someone's life, and that person doesn't realize that God is right next to them. The Bible says, that perceiving God's presence is something that you develop. You develop that ability to see God. Did you know that? You develop the ability to see God. Yeah, thank you. It's a bit hot here, isn't it? No, just get the fan so yeah. the air will uh, circulate. Yeah, thank you. Stop it. Um, so. Maybe we can keep one door open as well. Yeah. So apparently, uh, as we can see, perceiving God's presence is something that we need to have developed in our lives. How do you do that? How do you start seeing God? Noticing Him. How? When did Jacob began to perceive God in his life. When he was in his lowest moment. And from that moment on, he believed that Christ was God was always there by him, by his side, and his life changed. His life began to change. Began to change. And many years later, we're quickly gonna look at this. Let's see the difference that he made in his life. If you open uh, your Bible to Genesis 33, you're going to see the difference that he made to his life, perceiving that God was near him. Genesis 33, verse 10. And it says there, At the end of the verse, it says, Oh, I have seen your face, and it was like the face of God. What happened here? Who is he saying these words to? Let me explain to you the context. His brother wanted to kill him. He ran away from home. He was running away from his brother. He, all his life, he was scared to meet his brother again. But finally, it was unavoidable. His brother was chasing him down with an army. But God tells Jericho, Jacob, keep going, you're going to meet him. And uh, Jacob 
he's there struggling with God and talking to God, and God says, don't be afraid, keep going. Um, take a fall. I'm just going to send some gifts ahead of me so my brother can forgive me. Oh, I actually learned last week that's one thing that Filipinos do in the Philippines when they want to say sorry. Is that true? They send lots of gifts. I don't know. But that's what Esau, maybe you guys said, no, no, no. <laughs> but that's what uh, Esau did, um, Jacob did to his brother. And then when he got there, he saw his brother. He saw Esau coming. And then Esau did the most unexpected thing. He began to run towards Jacob. And he raced towards Jacob. And he hugged him. And they cried. And it was at that moment that Jacob said these words. For me to see your face, for me to see your forgiveness, is like seeing the face of God. Are you starting to realize now how you can see God? The face of God. So when you find God, you start seeing Him everywhere. You can see Him through a relative who couldn't stand before. You can see God through someone who was your enemy in the past. Or a circumstance that scared you. You can even see God through someone's death. And that's exactly what happened to Jacob. His life was completely transformed. So I have a question for you right now. Can you see God in your life? Can you feel God by your side? Can you hear God? Remember, in reality, this is an experience that we need to learn to develop. Because he's he was already by your side. It's his desire. But we need to develop the ability to see him. And there are three fundamental truths we must learn today. You can write it down if you want. You can put it in your phone, in your notes. Number one is, can God is always present and acting in your life, whether you see him or not. God is always present in your life, whether you see Him or not. Two, you and I need to learn to recognize the presence of God. It is something we need to develop. That is spiritual growth. What's the theme of our camp? Time to grow again. Spiritual growth is being able to see God. That's spiritual growth. And the third truth is that we have an obligation to see God. Yes, you and I need to grow. It's my task to constantly keep on seeking Him. Do you remember Joseph back in Egypt? The Bible says, And God was with Joseph. And Joseph knew that God was with him. How did Joseph know that God was with him? With him? How? How did... Joseph know that God was with him. How do we know that God is with us? Because he's not like everyone else. He's a spirit. He is invisible. He's not tangible. You can touch him. You can't hear him speak to you. So how do you know? It's a he's a transcendent being. How do you know God is in your life? It's just it reminds me of that servant of uh, Elijah. Elisha. He looks out. He only sees the enemy, and Elisha says, no, God's army is there. I can't see it. Or the, those disciples walking in Emmaus, and Jesus was not right next to them, talking to them, and they couldn't see him. Or they couldn't realize that he was him. The experience of the presence of God, and noticing the presence of God, takes place in a different way. How can we be sure that God is there. Well, my friends, it is possible for you to notice God in your life. And this is an exercise that uh, um, is very important and it's wonderful. And it, it's part of your free will. It's part of your ability to choose. And so, I want to quickly tell you four Things that are indicators of God's presence in your life. Before that, just read this text here with me. Can you read with me? Psalm 16, 8. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. 
I keep my eyes always. When I said to you that you can notice God in your life if you use your free will, you got to do like David. I keep my eyes. When he says, I keep, what, what is it basically saying? I choose to keep my eyes on the Lord. It's a choice. I choose to always keep my eyes on the Lord. A simple but profound sentence. An intentional decision to have God in our lives. Now, if, so before we finish this sermon, the four indicators that show that you are noticing God in your life. Four indicators that show that you are noticing God in your life. The first one of those indicators is this. The feeling of trust. Remember when God, God told Joshua, be strong and courageous. Don't be discouraged. Don't be afraid. I'm by your side. Joshua trusted. He trusted those words. He trusted. It's what, trust is when you know regardless of the circumstance, even when things are going wrong, you believe that God is by your side. You believe that He'll give you the strength. That's trust. Before the problem is solved, you believe that it's going to be okay. That is trust. That is trust. Last month I was reading for the Sabbath school lesson when we read uh, in Hebrews 11. I, come across, I came across a really interesting text in Hebrews 11, 27 that says that Moses, he stood up to one of the most powerful men in the earth, Pharaoh. It's like you're standing up to the, to the President of the United States and facing him by yourself as a simple citizen. That's what Moses did. And Hebrews 11, 27 says that he did that without fearing Pharaoh. Why? Do you know what? It says this. Because Moses kept right on going, because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. He chose to always keep his eyes on him who is invisible. How do you see somebody who is invisible? How can you perceive him? By trusting in him. By trusting in him. It is important that you believe him when he says that he wants to be by your side. Do not be afraid, God says, I will be with you. Has it, if anyone rejects you, that's okay. God's by your side. You mind yourself, God's by my side. I'm not afraid. When you face a moment of sadness, a moment of disappointment, just say, that's okay. God's by my side. God's by my side. I don't need to be afraid. And where does this kind of thinking come? Huh? You're stressed at work. You might lose your job. Or maybe you lose your job. And the thought comes to your mind. It's okay. What if someone cut you on the road? Someone cut you on the road. Yeah, but that one... That one passes quickly. But what about when you lose your job and you lose the ways to provide for your family? What about when you come across, you are committed by a disease that you cannot be cured of or nothing medicine can do? That moment when you say, God is with me. God is by my side. He helps me. I can get out of this. The situation will not destroy me. My life is in his hands. God is with me. Where does this thought come from? God is with me. Where does that come from? Trust. That's why Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. And he also said these words, Whatever I am now, it is all because of God poor out his special favor on me. Yet, it was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace from him. Yet, not I, but Christ in me. That's why you're able to say, it's okay. God's with me. It's okay. When God's by your side, you don't have to be afraid. Simply trust God. 
the second feeling or thought that shows your realization of God's by your side is a sense of direction, a sense of where to go, a sense of what to choose, decisions. Those moments when you are impressed by the Holy Spirit who guides you when you are making decisions. I went through these kind of moments last year. I don't know how many of you, some of you don't know, but I wanted to buy a house. I wanted to buy a house. Because I just watched everybody was buying a house. It was like a rat's race and the prices were shooting up. I didn't even have the money to buy the house, but I thought I could go to the bank and beg them to lend me money. And I, I was close to buying a house three times. <laughs> Josh, I told him this. <laughs> oh my goodness. To the point that was once, I literally, my offer was accepted. I put down the thousand, uh, the, the deposit, I don't remember how much it was. The deposit, the whole deposit. The whole deposit, I put down the deposit. But I had been praying, God, is this the house? Oh my Lord, I don't know what to do. Is this the house that I should buy? Oh, this is a big decision and I really want it. And I was stressed out and it was so, I was so tired and it was so difficult. And then, you know, I then um, decided, okay, God, I'm just going to do this. But please show me, please tell me, tell me, I depend on you. The location was good. It was a townhouse, but uh, I had a feeling. Even though I had done everything that had to be done, I had an impression that I should not go ahead with this. And that impression told me, give up on your business and cancel the purchase. And on the, at the deadline, the last day that I could cancel, the great spirit, I decided to cancel it. I had to pay a fine. It's okay. You know why it's okay? As soon as I canceled it, you were free. I was free. I had peace. I had a huge relief. So do you get it? When you know God is near, you sense those moments that God advises us and shows us that He's by our side. That's the will of the Holy Spirit. That's what He does in your mind. But I have to tell you that we have a problem. You know what your problem is? You know what my problem is? Our problem is that our desire for God's presence is selective. Mm -hmm. There are times when we don't want God to be present. There are times we want Him there, and there are times we don't want Him there. We want God by our side when it suits us, but there are moments we don't want God to see what we're doing. There's a famous question. The question says this, Who are you when no one is looking? As humans, sometimes we, we, like, we want to live in hiding. A lot of, there's a lot that we do that when no one is seeing. And it's important that we recognize God's presence by our side. Recognize that it's constant. It's not just when we want Him there. Whether you want it or not, He's always there. Many times we basically say, um, God, can you turn around just a bit? Don't look at me now. <laughs> I'm about to do something here, and I don't really want you to see it. Can you come back later? You know, you can even choose to do what is wrong, but when you are about to do it, just try to say this. God, I would like to pray. Can you go and come back later? Try this. Try this when you want to do something that you don't want God to see. And then you're going to remind, you're going to remember that God is there and you can keep on hiding. That's the choice we need to make in our hearts. In that moment, God asked my son, my daughter, where are you? Come out from your hiding. And when that happens, finally, you realize that you have to remove things from your life, things that God is seeing, and you're asking God, remove this from me, set me free, forgive me, 
That's your realization. And when you have that realization, finally you come to the fourth indicator that you know God is near. You, you have a, a sense of repentance from your sin. And once you have a sense of repentance, you know that you're forgiven, you trust that you're forgiven. Then the fourth indicator that you know God is near is a sense of joy. When someone makes, has a real experience with God, when you turn from sin, the result is joy. When you realize God is near you, you're going to be very, very happy. Without realizing it, you will be seeing the one. You're going to real, see the one who is invisible. Psalm 16:11 says, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. You're going to have that realization and that response that Jacob had when he woke up. He woke up and he realized God is really by my side. This is the fell, the house of God. God's presence will be a reality in your life and you will hear him speaking, I am your God, I am with you. God made a promise to Jacob. He kept it. God always fulfills his promise. And what about us? What are his promises to us? What did he promise? Christ said, in this world, you will have troubles. But take heart. I overcame those troubles. Take heart. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. He will wipe away every tear from your eye. So never forget it. In your life, or as simple or, or, as, or as complicated your life may be, God is always by your side. And today again he's saying, I am your God. My son, don't be afraid. My daughter, do not be afraid. As I finish, I want to ask you, how many of you want to have this assurance, certainty that God is by your side? How many of you? Amen. How many of you want to feel and sense that God is near you. Yeah? So, what I want to do is ask you if you want to be able to see and hear the one who is in this world, you are already seen, but you want to see. Can you stand with me? And I'll say a prayer, especially for you. Gracious Heavenly Father, many people who are standing here, Lord, they heard this message from you today. I know that some have not heard, some are still sleeping, and some don't realize that you're near. But many have heard you now. And many desire to see more of you. Many of us want to have this conviction that God is by our side like you promised Jacob, Isaac, Abraham. We want to see you, Lord. And we'd like to ask you, Heavenly Father, that you may open our eyes, that we may see. Help us to trust in you. Help us to depend on you for direction. Help us to realize our need for change. And then we will find joy, abundant joy like you have promised. Lord, you can see this person standing here. 
I'm standing here, my brother is standing here, my sister is standing here. And we are once again committing our heart to you. We are once again saying to you, God, take us. What do you want us to do? We thank you for your promises that never fail. And we pray this confidently. We also thank you, Lord, that we are about to share a meal together. And you know that you will be by our side as we fellowship. Stay with us in our heart. Thank you for the food. Thank you for providing. Thank you for your love that never fails. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.